the year at the Lunar Forum, and we also have at the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference. Uh, due to some of the discussions at NASA night, uh, we revamped the program a little bit, and I'm going to just brief, briefly just talk about league past and future activities. Uh, then I'm going to dive in for a little bit more of a presentation tied to the strategic knowledge gaps, uh, and particularly the strategic knowledge gap analysis. Uh, at least part one of the analysis that was accomplished by League. And again, remember, as Mike had mentioned, uh, these knowledge gap documents ideally uh, uh, are, are, will be utilized as uh, to, to develop the NASA investment portfolio for human exploration by HEOMD. Uh, and then Clive is going to speak uh, for a few minutes on changes to the League Lunar Exploration Roadmap activities that have been taking place uh, over the last couple months. And then finally, we're going to hopefully have an open discussion uh, with regards to the League and community response, responses to changes in the NLSI Charter. Uh, this diagram, this chart just illustrates the, uh, shows the, the members of the League Executive Committee, which for those of you who go to these regularly, uh, this is a, a rehash. And again, what we're still waiting for is to uh, update uh, and include a member from the Office of the Chief Technologist. Uh, very recently, just prior to this meeting, at the end of last week, uh, League, CAPTEM, the LPI, and NLSI sponsored a workshop in, uh, in Bozeman, Montana. That was essentially the second conference on lunar highland crust. It was attended by between 40 and 50 individuals. And uh, David Kring mentioned to me when he went through the numbers that approximately 40% of those were students or postdocs. So this whole workshop was just extremely important in bringing new people, new lunar scientists on board on some of the, the really important problems tied to the composition, the evolution, the distribution of the lunar highlands crust. Uh, this workshop was also, prior to the workshop, there was a field trip that we explored uh, the lower section of the Stillwater Complex, a layered intrusion, one of the world's famous layered intrusions. And on Monday, there was a field trip to the upper section of the Stillwater, uh, which focused upon the, the anorthosites associated with the layered intrusion. Uh, what we've also have done uh, over, I think, since the, since the beginning of the year, uh, we did have this GAPSAT meeting, uh, which were strategic knowledge gaps for the moon first human exploration scenario. And uh, the website that uh, you can find that is uh, shown here. And that's the league website that is hosted by the LPI, and also the League conducted a study uh, for, for Earth Moon L2 Research Facility. And again, that's not, uh, hasn't been posted yet, and uh, the NASA uh, people are, are currently reviewing that report, and hopefully shortly it will be uh, it will be on the website also. Uh, one other thing I just wanted to, to mention is for this workshop, uh, the NLSI did provide uh, travel funds for, for at least several of those students. So again, you know, the L NLSI was extremely helpful in, uh, in helping us grow with regards to our student and young persons uh, within lunar and planetary lunar science. And then finally, I just want to mention the League annual meeting is October 22nd to 24th of this year. It's in Greenbelt, Maryland, and it's being hosted 
by the by Goddard uh, Space Flight Center. And abstracts are due on August 1st, although due to some of the chaos tied to NASA approving workshops and meetings, et cetera, uh, very similar to what we had here. Uh, the, ab the, abstract, the abstract date may be moved slightly, but if you want to abstract, to submit an abstract, you know, shoot for the August 1st deadline. Okay, can we go to uh, talk two? Yeah, what I'd like to do now is just give you a, a little bit more detailed overview of the Lunar Exploration Analysis Group uh, SAT that examined the specific knowledge gaps for a moon first scenario. And again, this is the scenario that we go to the moon first prior to going to any other planetary body. And again, that's followed by either taking a detour to asteroids or going on directly to the Mars system. Uh, the league charter uh, for the SAT is outlined here. And again, all our SATs are organized by charter to begin with. And the League Exploration Analysis Group was tasked by HEOMD to establish a specific action team to examine strategic knowledge gaps. Uh, and they outlined, shown right here, is some of the analyses that should be done tied to these knowledge gaps. And again, the focus of the SKGs are really in the context again, of a moon first scenario. I think the SBAG group was asked to look at SKGs in terms of an asteroid first scenario. And again, MEPEG was asked to do a similar analysis of strategic knowledge gaps. Again, this is tied, this isn't gaps in science per se, but really knowledge gaps tied to human exploration of the moon. Uh, we are to identify gaps in the knowledge and data sets that need to be filled in order to implement a specific, specific mission scenarios. And then we were also asked to identify me individual measurements and instruments that needed to uh, be made and utilized in order to fill these knowledge gaps. And then we were also asked to identify specific robotic precursors that could be used to fill these knowledge gaps. And we were also asked to link this to any sort of potential uh, similarities to uh, science and exploration initiatives noted in the League uh, Lunar Exploration document, but also link these to past National Academy studies, uh, primarily to the Cato survey, which we did. In terms of a schedule, on, uh, we first met on December 15th and 16th at the LPI uh, and hammered out the initial draft of this document over those two-day period of time. After substantial uh, communication uh, by teleconferences and emails, we did produce an initial draft that was delivered to NASA at the end of January. And uh, a final set of findings for this phase one was delivered to NASA uh, on March 1st after they made substantial comments. Uh, the, this review was presented at the GLEX meeting in DC in May 2012. I'm presenting it here and it will present, be presented at the League Annual Meeting uh, in October. Uh, just prior to this meeting at Ames, uh, a smaller subset of this SAT also reviewed the SKGs and tied it into the League Lunar Exploration Roadmap. Again, on Monday, I think we spent the day doing that. Uh, Prior to December 15th, uh, HEOMD would like us to examine instruments and measurements 
that are needed to fill these SKGs. And if you would, if you're interested in participating in this activity, uh, please let Clive and I know uh, during this meeting, or you can email Clive and I. And what we anticipate, how we anticipate running this phase two is essentially dividing, uh, setting up three individual groups tied to the various themes within the SKGs, and then doing most of the work by teleconference. So if you're interested, but really aren't, really don't want to travel, uh, you know, this is the SAT for you because uh, we will do it primarily with teleconferences. And again, as I mentioned, uh, this is the site for the report on the bottom right here. The GAPSAT membership is located here and it represented individuals from NASA, from universities, from the private sector, and from other academic uh, institutions. And the ex officio members uh, in included Chris Colbert, uh, John Conley, and Mike Wargo. Uh, let me just give you just an overview because we do have other work I'd, I'd like to do before uh, and finish off by, by 5.30. Uh, the way we organize the SKGs is, is, is shown here in which we had individual uh, SKG themes, understanding uh, the lunar resource potential, uh, understand the lunar environment its, and its effects on human life, and understand how to work and live on the lunar surface. And, and again, with this phase two, what I'd like to do is have the analysis group broken up into these three themes. So uh, when you talk to Clive and I, again, uh, please also let us know which of these teams you'd like to be associated with. Uh, from those themes, what we then broke this up into is individual categories such as lunar resources or, or solar resources, uh, a variety of regolith resources, and uh, ISRU production efficiencies in a few different steps. Uh, as you can see in the understanding the lunar environment and its effect on human life, we looked at solar activity, radiation on the surface, biological impacts of dust, and uh, maintaining peak human health. And then you can read the, uh, the last group shown here, starting from really resource production to navigation, uh, blast ejecta and dust, uh, micrometeorite and radiation uh, shielding, and lunar mass contributions and distributions, et cetera. And then from these SKG categories, what I just have to your right are real examples of the SKGs. Like, for example, under solar resources, we have uh, what's called a, a category called solar illumination mapping. As consumer reports, uh, what we ended up doing, and again, this isn't a grade for what's the best SKG that needs the most work and what's the worst. This is just simply tied to where those SKGs, that SKG research can be done uh, in terms of venue. Uh, so it's got a red circle for the preferred location, whether it's RNA programs on Earth, other Earth-based testing, uh, the International Space Station, uh, or on the surface of the moon. And then, so the red is preferred location, the black highly relevant, uh, the next one is somewhat relevant, and then the open circle is not relevant at all. And again, I just want to emphasize, this does not mean that the SKG is not relevant. It just means that that particular location is not relevant to filling that SKG. What we concluded fairly early is that following the completion of the LRO mission, there really are no strategic knowledge gaps that really would inhibit the flight of an Apollo-style mission. 
So that's where we're essentially coming from right now. However, within the context of the moon force scenario, and remember that scenario develops assets and capabilities for human activity within the Earth-Moon system, uh, we were able to identify a number of enabling and enhancing SKGs uh, that really are required to be filled in order to have a much more mature human exploration of the moon and inhabiting and, and essentially enabling and enhancing what we do after the moon. And so in all of these charts, what we've identified is enabling technologies that the SKGs uh, must be done in order to carry out a moon for a scenario uh, to enable safety, reliability, operational and resource utilization issues, and then enhancing SKGs uh, where the SKG would essentially inhibit science exploration value and the effectiveness of carrying out the exploration and science tasks. Let me just give you a couple of examples. And, and again, I strongly urge you to go to and look at this document uh, uh, tonight or tomorrow. And again, you know, check with Clive and I if you have any questions. Uh, what I'd like to do is just point out that uh, one example I'm going to give is just solar resources, Oops. shown here, and primarily focusing on solar illumination mapping. And as you can see here, uh, the solar resource, solar illumination mapping can be best done with robotic missions and an RNA program tied to that mission. And uh, the emphasis down in here uh, detailed mapping enables polar exploration missing site selection for the future. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at just the biological impact of dust. And again, we'll go to 2C, biological effects of lunar dust uh, and Earth-based testing, essentially. Uh, this shown is shown uh, here in this upper row in terms of research and analysis is important to fund by uh, HEOMD and this is tied to earth-based testing and again the narrative is shown here that you can read or a summary of the narrative and again this is absolutely imperative or and is enabling for long-term uh, human activity on the lunar surface. Finally, let's go ahead and I'll just, I just picked out plasma environment and charging and primarily focusing on plasma environment and charging. And as you can see, at least in this portion, there is, uh, we think that to better gain a better understanding to uh, this SKG, a, robo a robotic lunar mission is necessary. And again, please read the, the narrative. I won't go ahead and read it. But again, this, again, we interpret this as really being enabling for surface operations and also for human safety. What we ended up, what we're asked to do, as I mentioned, is trying to find linkages to the NRC Planetary Science Decadal Survey and again, you know, part of the reason why we were asked to do this is essentially to look at, you know, HEOMD is trying to fill these knowledge gaps. What could be the SMD contribution to some of these robotic missions or research programs that could essentially enable science? And again, these uh, dots essentially identify uh, those specific knowledge gaps that have been mentioned in the Planetary Science Decadal Survey. Finally, we were also asked to link the SKGs to the Lunar Exploration Roadmap, again, 
that we focused on on Monday, and also to the league robotic precursor campaign that we were asked to do, probably when was that, was last year? And, okay. And if you're interested, uh, this was a letter that went to HEOMD and SMND, and the letter can be found at uh, this website right here that outlines a pre-phase one, what sort of research can be done uh, building on the results of uh, current missions. Uh, and also, uh, and, and even the Apollo sample collection. Phase one is essentially a lunar resource prospecting uh, phase of the robotic campaign that not only looks to see how one prospects for potential resources, but also in those types of missions, one can fulfill other or fill other SKGs such as evaluating plasma environment charging, uh, uh, dust uh, issues, uh, blast ejecta, surface track, uh, trafficability, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So again, these styles of missions during phase one are not just simply lunar resource prospecting. And then that's followed by uh, increasing more, more complex robotic missions robo and robotic slash human missions. And again, within the, con the concept of the robotic precursor missions, uh, League identified, again, utilizing, expanding resource utilization. But again, during those phases, there are so many other SKGs that could be filled. And this diagram just illustrates, again, the types of science and measurements that can be done during phase, pre-phase one, phase one, phase two, and phase three. And as you can see, during these phases, like uh, 2D, maintaining peak human health, uh, those sorts of SKGs can be filled, you know, just across the board from pre-phase one all the way to phase three. Let's take a look at just some of the findings, because again, I didn't really want to go through all the charts. Uh, you can do that at your leisure. Uh, but finding one is, again, we, we did conclude that for Apollo-style missions, there really are no SKGs that must be filled. But obviously, we want to go beyond Apollo. And for in the context of the moon first scenario, as I've shown, there are dozens and dozens of SKGs that both enable and enhance a more mature exploration of the moon that must be filled. Although, again, uh, the SKGs are highly dependent on the architecture we focused, and particularly on one theme, on resources and resource utilization, because our group thought utilizing resources on the moon and away from Earth was a real game changer in how one explores the moon, works in the Earth-Moon system, and goes beyond the Earth-Moon system. Uh, Prior to robotic missions, we identified the number of SKGs that can, be, that can be filled with current research funding and work on uh, the ISS, Earth-based te Earth technology development, and uh, lunar samples. We also then, in summary, set up a, a systematic robotic precursor program that allows us to fill some of those knowledge gaps. And many of these knowledge gaps can be linked to uh, NRC Planetary Science Decadal Survey, uh, other NRC studies like Lunar Exploration Science uh, document, and the League Roadmap. And then finally, what I want to mention that 
the moon scenario, the moon first scenario, is I think perhaps the, the best scenario to follow. Uh, there are just so many overlaps that cross cut other potential destinations that we can do first and best on the moon. And why go ahead and stop there? And Clive, why don't you go ahead and you can start with the roadmap and then from there we'll go on we'll to go the good stuff. The good stuff. All yeah. right, fucking right, talk three up, please, Ricky. Weird. That next one, there we go. That's the one. Okay. Um, again, just want to give you a, a chip has gone over much of this, and I'm going to blast through the first, um, the first eight or so slides at bulky type speed. Um, so, so, so bear with me on this one. Again, um, just to bring you up to date with what we've done in 2011, we we did look at the lunar exploration roadmap in terms of how it fit in with the with the latest decade or the visions and voyages 2013-2022. Uh, and uh, we sent a letter to Jim Green outlining the, the synergies between the Lunar Exploration Roadmap um, and, uh, and, the, uh, uh, and, and the Decadal Survey. And uh, you can, again, that letter is open to the community. It's on our website, the League website. At the, uh, that Chip showed that website many times. I'm sure you're all, all going to remember it, or at least until you have your second beer. Um, the, the other thing was the uh, implementation program. One of the things that we looked at with the exploration roadmap was, well, how the hell are you going to implement it? Um, so we tried to think of what, what is the what are the one thing or the one series of missions, robotic precursor missions, that would allow implementation of this e uh, exploration roadmap. And that's where Chip put up the slide and said, you know, ISIU is going to be a game changer. It's going to allow us to utilize the, uh, uh, the resources on the lunar surface uh, so that we can then minimize the cost of bringing, uh, bringing material from uh, this planet. Um, it will then, as it evolves, allow us then to, to use those resources to go elsewhere. And as the Augustine Commission cracked on about the, the gravity well, well, the biggest gravity well we have is Earth. So if we can minimize that by lunar, using lunar resources, we can then, uh, we can then minimize the cost of, uh, of going elsewhere beyond the moon. And, and the roadmap is all for that in terms of its uh, feed forward theme. So uh, phase one is this prospecting aspect, is identifying using the existing orbital data of where the, best, uh, where the likelihood of the best resources are, and then going to look, at, look for those resources and define uh, the actual resource in terms of the third dimension. If we then look at uh, the resource mining on the basis of those results, we then put an end-to-end -end, uh, pilot plant to show the feasibility of using uh, those resources and actually producing uh, usable materials and uh, life support systems. Um, and then the last one is the, is the resource production, this large-scale large production plant that would be uh, in operation prior to, uh, to, to humans arriving and, and have for extended stays beyond Apollo. Um, and as Chip pointed out, we can do many things, many other things as part of this uh, mining effort in terms of the geotechnical aspects of regolith, the plasma, the dust mitigation. There are many other things that are associated with this, but the actual mining, producing, storing, transporting, utilizing resources is the game changer that allows us to go beyond Apollo. As I said many times before, Apollo was fantastic. Let's not, let's not knock Apollo, but Apollo was not sustainable. What makes the next thing sustainable and one of those is being able to uh, utilize the, the, the resources on the moon. So uh, again, we, we put up that ultimate goal, and I've highlighted it here, is to change the economics of human space exploration via the use of in-situ resource utilization. Um, in the roadmap, we identify a lot of things in terms of commercial on-ramps. There are companies um, that are, and with representation here, that want to uh, want to use those resources, produce those resources. I mean, this is this is the game changer. It is is a way for for commerce to get involved in the private sector to come in uh, early on in our next exploration of the moon, um, and allow us to not only explore the moon but go beyond the moon. 
And I think that's something that we need to emphasize more and more, uh, not only to our community, but to other communities that are out there. Um, the GAPSAP meeting, Chip has gone through and given you a, a quite detailed look at that. Uh, we met on Monday to map back those, uh, those strategic knowledge gaps into the roadmap. Uh, revision is underway with regard to that. Um, and the, the, the uh, Lunar Exploration Roadmap has identified many of these SKGs already, but there are some modifications that are needed, and that's the whole point of the roadmap. It's a living document. It's not a static document. We have new data, we have new requirements, we have new needs, we need to respond to it. And it's important when Chip said, if you want to volunteer for the SAT, please do so. It's important to get involved because it's a community effort. It's not done by one or two people. And if you go and look at the ever-growing list of folks that have contributed to the, to the roadmap itself, it is, it is a community effort. Um, and mapping back these strategic knowledge gaps is now very important. If and when the moon comes back in vogue, we need to be ready to hand over a roadmap that is up to date, current, ready to go. Um, and the other activity I've asked uh, Mihal and, uh, and Bill Farrell uh, to uh, take the roadmap and give it a good scrubbing in terms of dust and plasma, because one of the things that came out as a deficit in our meeting on Monday was the, uh, was the fact that these issues are, are underrepresented in the current version of the roadmap. And again, as, as more people look at this and utilize this, there are going to be a lot more deficiencies that come out. We need to address it, and we need to, we need to move on. And that's my roadmapping update. Um, and again, I want to uh, move on to the, to the uh, other issue. And uh, this is something that after the NASA night yesterday, uh, many people uh, spoke to myself and Chip and seemed a little uh, concerned with what was said uh, during uh, Jim Green and Mike Wargo's uh, talks and responses to questions with regards to what happens to the NASA Lunar Science Institute. And if we have, we, we're not, we don't have, we have seven highly productive and cohesive teams, not nodes. We're not the Astrobiology Institute, so I apologize for that. And, and we can see from this forum over the, over the years that this forum has been going, how the next generation has actually come along. I mean, when the vision for space exploration came out, I was a young guy. I was one of the lunar young guys, which I, now I'm quite depressed because I'm now an old fart. But, uh, <laughs> but that's due to the fact that the next generation of, the, of lunar scientists, and a lot of you are out here, have come on board because of the NASA Lunar Science Institute. And it has promoted that. And what is bothering a lot of people, and me included, is, well, what happens next? What happens to this growing community next? If there is flat funding, and we now open it up to a moon, asteroids, and Mars system, what does that do to this growing community of next generation of lunar scientist. It's certainly not going to grow it because we have seven nodes at the moment. If it's flat funding, we're going to have seven nodes with other destinations involved. And that to me is a, is a concern that we should all be um, aware of and we should all, um, we should all address. Uh, so again, there, there are a number of things that we can do. And one of those things is to write a community letter to Jim Green and Mike Wilder. And what I've done in the next couple of slides is I've put together a, 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 some, some narrative uh, that I would like to share with you. And uh, then there will be some sheets going around. And if you agree in principle to this, we can wordsmith till we die. I don't want to do that. But if you, if you agree with the, uh, with the sentiment behind this, um, uh, I would ask that you sign up on the sheets that get passed around. And especially if you are a student or a postdoc, I would like you to indicate that so that we can include that in the, in the letter that we hope to send out on Monday of next week to Jim Green and Mike Wargo. Um, and well, without further ado, um, I'll read through it uh, to Jim Green and Mike Wargo. It says, we, the undersigned, are writing to you regarding a number of issues regarding the NASA Lunar Science Institute and its successor. We thank you for your support in establishing the NLSI and your enthusiasm for rebuilding the lunar science community. 
However, the NASA night on July 17th at the Lunar Science Forum left the lunar community, as represented at this meeting, concerned about the future. For example, there was praise for the way NLSI has developed the next generation of lunar scientists. However, with, with presumed flat funding and expanding the Institute to include asteroids, the Mars system, and the Moon, the lunar science community will shrink. Uh, this is at odds with what was stated at NASA night that the NLSI has applauded for growing the lunar science community. We understand and agree that SMND and HERMD synergies are vital in the continuation of the Institute and that the Institute should evolve. There are certainly synergies in terms of asteroids and the Moon as airless bodies. However, inclusion of Mars in the new Institute will dilute the focus that now serves the Institute well and many involve and may involve divergent destination-dependent goals. This will adversely affect the environment of cohesion that the teams currently have. We strongly urge caution in the path forward to evolve the NLSI. We see the inclusion of Mars as making the new institute too broad. Mars has its own program within SMD. The moon and asteroids do not. Expanding the Mars community further promotes an unbalanced emphasis within SMD and limits the effectiveness of the Institute in supporting human exploration of the Moon and asteroids within the next 10 to 15 years. Finally, we conclude that the continued vitality of the lunar science community is critical for solar system science and human exploration. Expanding the Institute to include other airless bodies is a logical evolution. Inclusion of Mars will diffuse the, will diffuse the effectiveness of the new institute in supporting SMD and HEOMD solar system exploration goals and will certainly stop the growth of the young next generation of young next generation of lunar scientists something you have both championed as a major achievement of the NLSI yours sincerely the undersigned there will be there are now some sheets being passed around if you feel that you can sign up to a letter of this type, we would like you to sign your name, affiliation, email address, um, and uh, whether or not you are a student or a postdoc. And I'll, with, with somewhat trepidation, I'll open it up to questions. And there's a Pam Clark at the back who's storming forward, which is scary. Where are the microphones? Do we have a microphone anywhere? <laughs> well, here comes a microphone, but you can use that one. Thank you. Okay, I, I will do anything to, you know, I eat, sleep, and breathe NASA. I cut my teeth on the moon, and I'm and very supportive of, of keeping the Lunar Science Institutes Lunar Institutes. And the reason for that, of course, is because the moon is a keystone to doing anything else. But we have a problem, Houston. We have a problem here. And the problem is that the decadal survey does not reflect the sentiment in the planetary community that sees the moon as playing a critical role. This is very constraining and very difficult to respond to. Um, because, you know, the, the, the knowledge deficits, I mean, if, he, if, if the way the perspective, if 50% of the respondents to the decadal survey saw the moon as critical for a variety of reasons, there's important science to be done on the moon. We, we, they're, they're, the moon is accessible to us compared to other targets. And that means also the technology we can, we, that we need to develop to go anywhere for a lot less cost needs to be developed on the lunar surface. So I'd just like to know, anybody has some creative idea about how to deal with that constraint that the Cato survey itself actually Im imposes on us moving forward. And I think we should talk about alternative architectures. Today we had a meeting on, a, on something that's based on CubeSat, which has been highly successful in creating a sustainable environment for Earth orbital science, and it's just maturing after 10 years, which we can learn a tremendous amount from. And that's not at all reflected in, in the decadal survey. How, how do we deal with that? I am a man with no answers. But how, how do we deal with that? We, we must emphasize that the number of white papers that went in from you, the lunar community, to the decadal survey was the same as the number of white papers that went in for Mars. Mars gets its own chapter. We were put in within inner solar system planets. However, the fact of the community response was not lost. I do know that, and we, but we need to make sure that that is not forgotten. And that's something else that we can probably add into that ladder with regards to the decadal survey. 
George. So these institutes, these, these nodes, teams, families, and this forum in particular combines a bunch of different sciences to all like work at on a common goal on the moon or about the moon. But it is such a diverse amount of different sciences. There's hardcore chemists here. There's hardcore particle physicists that talk about stuff that just blows my mind. I have no idea what they're saying, but it's it's fantastic. And I've never seen that at any at the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference. I've never seen um, that at any of the other places I've been to, at least not to this sort of like proportion. So it's going to definitely, that's going to be diluted. You're going to just have a bunch of planetary scientists again if you make this into a, asteroids and Mars and stuff like that. I, 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 it's, it's diverse already, I agree. Clive, I may actually have a suggestion on this. Uh, there's a National Academy of Sciences group right now. Um, Marsha Smith's on it. Uh, there's several people. It's this whole thing for NASA strategic direction. Huh. It's open right Excellent. now. They are accepting comments. Uh, I wrote uh, comments about a lunar-centric. Uh, I've been publishing articles right here lately and feeding them into that. Right. That would be a very appropriate venue for this community That's to sure. have an official input into that as a community and the relevance of the moon. Can you send me the details on that? Yes, sir, I can. Because uh, that, that would be really good and I can pass that out to, you know, by the Lunar L and, and other and NLSI uh, email lists. So, Russell. Thanks. So that was the, the encouraging thing that Mike Wargo said was that the, he was talking about capabilities first. And I think if we as a community focus on both capabilities and results, the data produced this conference in particular is we now know more about the moon than we did three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. And if I'm a grad student and I want to propose uh, to run an experiment, going back to the moon where we now have discovered the plasma environment is much more exciting and interesting than we thought. And we know the volatiles environment is much more exciting and interesting than we thought. Even if someday I'd like to go to Europa, you said, well, I can go test new theories with new data at the moon today um, and pave the road to other places. And mm -hmm. So that's a very strong argument. And, and if, so if we keep that focus of it's about creating students, that's another feature of the Lunar Cubes model, is that the sort of thing a grad student or a postdoc can do? Um, some, you can send some CubeSats to Mars, but it'll always be you can get two or three or four no, I, I, more I, to I, the moon than you can to Mars. I understand the the idea of pushing the CubeSats, but well, I... Well, keep pushing education and I, pushing I think results. I think the important thing is is to wrap that into the in, into this this institute. Where do we go right. from here? Right. I, I think that that's a facet of it. Um, I don't want to see this response as pushing um, an agenda. It's It's a community response to the fact that we've been growing. Um, we have we have made great progress over yeah. these last, as you said, over these last four years. There are ways and avenues ahead that we can explore. However, if if you suddenly stop the growth and reverse it, right, that's not going to happen. Yeah. And I and I think it's important to to uh, to emphasize that. And that's what I'm trying to do here. I, I would I would yeah, never I, make I a agree. politician, but uh, this is about as diplomatic. And it's, this has been scrubbed by several people, so... Uh, no, no, I appreciate it. I mean, your letter is, is perfect. I'm not yeah. suggesting you change that. I told you... The idea of, of reinforced success, reinforced absolutely. education, absolutely. reinforced okay, results. Absolutely. Okay, gotcha. Gotcha. Perfect. I, is it still on? Yep. I don't know whether this is something that would be of a great deal of interest to you guys, but there's two aspects, one from material science, and one from electronics that is about to just kick the bejesus out of the entire space industry. Uh, the, the thing from uh, material science is that a couple of years ago, somebody made a, an offhand comment that you could build a lunar elevator out of dental floss. And I actually checked it out, and indeed you can. Dental floss, of course, nowadays is spectra, which is 4.3 gigapascals and a density slightly less than water. So it, it turns out that you can really do that in a modest effort on the thing in the context of much larger developments will get you a, a capability of 1,000 tons per day to the lunar surface. 
and back. I'm going to have to call a question on here because and this, this is, is, is this related to the response, community response aspect? That no, we're but something big is coming along. And the other thing yeah. is that lasers are going to make it much less expensive to get into space. Okay. Thank you. Other comments or questions or concerns with regard to sending something like this into, uh, in, into NASA from the community? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, Clive, I, I applaud everything you're doing, and I hope that it has some effect. But um, it, it's talking about our major concerns, and I think it needs a little bit more of a threatening attitude toward it. That's, some, that's something, more Larry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> something like the idea that we have a lot of interest in the moon by foreign countries, uh, and that they may well move ahead of us in, in, you know, we're going to have to take off our shoes when we land on the moon and all that sort of good stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the fact is that that, that <laughs> is something that's, that's very real and could be something to, to bring up again. They know of it, but mention the fact that we also know it and we're afraid of it. And that may be a point to be made. Okay. Thanks, Larry. Okay. Go ahead. Well, essentially, we're looking at um, a, a stop of the growth of resources. And I think maybe it's time to uh, look at the charter of the Lunar Science Institute and say maybe this should be something that's not only uh, talking about the on ramp, but also actively soliciting. The, the commercial environment for sure. support because there's not going to be the manpower, they're not going to be young scientists. Who are they going to hire when they want to go out and start mining the moon? It makes mm -hmm. no sense mm -hmm. uh, for industry to be unaware of, of, of this. This is, a, this is a critical lead issue. And also your, your ability to independently do what you want depends on the financial independence you have. Right. You know, SMD has been basically shutting the water off on, you know, Lunar Quest is gone and where are the new missions and, you know, we still have some remnant uh, money in the Office of the Chief Technology and, and the uh, Operations and Exploration Directorate. But, uh, you know, the, the real money will come as, as the commercial uh, aspect of this develops. So I think part of the charter of this should be not only just to advise NASA, but also to, to be a, a resource for, for commercial development uh, of the lunar resources in space. And I think that's going to draw, you know, it's a small beginning, but it's a way of defining a charter for yourself as opposed to only being uh, a subsidiary of giving advice to, right. to NASA. Okay. Thanks, David. So we've got one down here and then Jack Burns. Uh, over there. Put your hand up, Jack. The microphone's coming. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Someone expanding on what Pam said, and let me play devil's advocate here for a moment. If SMD puts additional resources into anything, the community will grow. So the mere argument that additional resources have been deployed to the lunar community and it's grown and now if those go down, that's a bad thing, that could be said for anything. I mean, any community or any area in which SMD works, not only planetary science. What seemed to strike me in this letter, and recognizing you said it had been scrubbed, the aspect of future de potential destinations in the near future, in the next one to two decades, mm -hmm. what are those? Yeah. That seems to come very late in the letter. Okay. And I wonder if that should move much closer to the beginning to hammer home the point that if you really want science-based exploration or exploration that um, in includes or builds upon science, you've really got to be looking at the destinations that humans can get to in the next one to two decades. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. Thank you. Jack. I actually wanted to follow up a little bit on Larry's comment about international participation because I think that's an important part of this letter. It should be in this letter. You and I and a few others were at this GLEX uh, 2012 conference in Washington yeah. and I think we were all stunned in one of the panels in which the uh, panelists, we had uh, senior leadership from uh, JAXA, from the Russian Space Agency and so forth. And a question was asked of each of them, 
what do you think the next step is in exploration and going beyond the International Space Station? And what I found stunning is the Russian representative came right out and said, well, of course, the moon is where we want to go. I haven't heard the Russians talk about going to the moon since the 1960s, okay? <laughs> and there was no hesitation. This is something that was thought about deeply. Yep. And they went to the JAXA representative and said, well, yes, my colleague from Russia is right. Yep. That, you know, the next stepping stone is the moon. The international community is coalescing yes. on the moon as the next step. Yep. And, you know, the, the momentum is building in that direction. Internal studies within NASA, I think, is also some of the, you know, the L2 kind of missions also coalescing around this. We need to feature this I agree. in I agree. this letter yep. and make sure that, uh, you know, if we destroy the lunar community uh, and all the momentum that we've built, we're also going to be playing catch up to the international community, which I think is starting to get out front of us on this. Yeah, I, that's a very good point. And again, that's now we're scavenging. Yeah. The uh, comments about lasers got me thinking about another laser, the ROSE's laser program. And, uh, you know, it's a uh, demise. I think we'll have a even larger effect on young scientists when they go to get their own funding. You know, if you're not in on the ground floor with these nodes or teams or whatever, you're kind of out of luck for a couple of years. Whereas well, well laser, laser, I saw in Mike's charts at least, he doesn't think laser's going away. I didn't hear Jim talk about it, but um, uh, I'm hoping that the funding stays there. Okay, well, let's not just hope. Let's put that in Next. the recommendation here. Okay. Yeah. And we'll, we'll include the laser program as, as an example. So, Bill. Um, I want to be a little careful on this point. I, I like this letter very much. But I would point out that I don't think Jim Green is the one that is really having to say as to how the can goes. I, my understanding is this is being handled above Jim Green. Okay. And tomorrow, we have a video con that includes John Grunsfeld, which is talking about human exploration and planetary science and how we can go forward together. In a careful way, maybe something like this should be brought up during a q and I agree, and you used the term careful. Very, very uh, careful. We don't, so want to, I we don't want to burn bridges do here. That's not the goal, but I think. I, mean, no, I, I, I hear you, and it's, it, it's on my list. Okay. Um, uh, let me just ask you the question then, Bill, and other people. Do you think these people should go to Bill Gerstenmeyer and John Grunsfeld? Uh, I'll say that again. Should this letter go, this community letter, should it go to John Grunsfeld and Bill Gerstenmeyer? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I don't see why not. Okay. Any other questions, comments? It probably won't. It, it, it would be a good follow-on to it from the Q&A session that, that could occur. I think we need to be prepared. And I, Chip and I were talking, and, and, and we plan to sort of knock this out um, Monday, send it Monday. So it is done, um, done quickly in response to it. Um, the, the other thing that, that Chip just mentioned to me is that in response to the, the National Academy, uh, we will use that letter as a basis of a, of a league input to National Academy. And with, with your blessing, we will uh, we'll take your names along with it. So as the National Academy said, the more white papers we have, more multi-authored white papers, the more notice we take of it. So um, if we can use uh, your names in that vein, uh, we would like to do so. And does anybody object to that? It's a resounding no. Um, any other questions? We've been going for about an hour, just under an hour. Um, yes? Yes. Yes, I am. And the letter will be available on the League website. So you can then chastise me for not including everything then I will chastise Noah, who didn't take the notes. <laughs> so I'll just say chastise Noah. How about that? Um, thanks, everybody. Uh, it's poster session time. Uh, hopefully the beer has been replenished.